Lord, open our eyes wide. Teach us more and more. Show us those things that would make us wise so that Jesus we may adore today, we pray. Amen. Many of us have seen the movie, The Wizard of Oz. Perhaps you've even read the book. More of us, though, have probably seen the classic movie. There's a scene in the movie in which Dorothy, the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Lion, they finally reach the Emerald City, and they appear before the great Wizard of Oz. Do you remember that scene? The giant screen, it's shown this powerful, larger-than-life figure with a booming voice. He's surrounded by flames and sounds of thunder and flashes of lightning. But then Toto, Dorothy's little dog, pulls back a curtain, and everyone discovers that this wizard is not who he has made himself out to be. He ends up being just a man behind a curtain. By his own admission, a good man, but a very bad wizard. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's lights and amplification. His cry of pay no attention to the man behind the curtain falls on deaf ears. He's revealed for who he truly is when this curtain is pulled back. In our text today, in Mark's gospel, Mark records an event where a curtain is pulled back and Jesus is seen and revealed for who he truly is. And unlike the Wizard of Oz, when this curtain is pulled back on Jesus Christ, he's revealed as far more than just a man. Before the eyes of Peter, James, and John, his inner circle of disciples, this curtain is pulled back to unveil the magnificent, radiant, and inherent glory of the Son of God. This event, the transfiguration, it's one of the most memorable and remarkable events of Jesus' earthly ministry, save his death and resurrection. In fact, it's one of the few accounts in Jesus' life that's recorded in each of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Even the apostle John seems to hint at this event when he writes in the opening of his gospel, we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. So impressive was this transfiguration event upon the Apostle Peter that he recalls it many years later, near the end of his life, as he's writing his second epistle to his readers, which we've just heard from a few moments ago. In this key event in Jesus' ministry, Jesus' glory is unveiled. In our passage this morning in verses 1 to 8 of chapter 9, we discover that behind this curtain, Jesus is God's beloved Son, the radiance of God's glory, so therefore we should look and listen to Him. The prophet Isaiah prophesied long ago to the people of Judah, your eyes will behold the King in all His beauty. Surely what Peter, James, and John saw that day on the mountain was the Lord and King of glory in all his beauty. And on top of this sight, they also hear the thunderous voice of God the Father coming through a cloud, commanding them to listen to his beloved and radiant Son. Talk about a mountaintop experience for these men. Nothing that we experience in this life probably parallels what these three men are enjoying and experiencing on top of this mountain. Well, we're going to spend our time on top of this mountain where Jesus is unveiled. Today we're going to make four stops at major point, points during this mountaintop experience, one before we even ascend the mountain and three more as we reach the summit that are going to steadily unveil the glory of Jesus Christ as well as its implications for us as believers today. Our first stop comes at the base of the mountain. It's in verse 1 where Jesus made a promise in the conclusion of his teaching on discipleship. Jesus said to the crowd and to the disciples who were listening to him, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. As many of our English translations designate, this verse really does belong back at the end of chapter 8. But the division that is made 
is really an interpretive decision on behalf of our English translators, and it's caused quite a stir in the theological world. It's created such a significant dispute among Bible scholars and theologians. They're all debating over what Jesus is referencing to concerning this coming of the kingdom of God with power. What does Jesus mean? What is he talking about? There are basically four mainline interpretations. There's more, but I'll whittle it down to four for us this morning. I'm going to briefly outline them for us right now. We're not going to get too bogged down by the details of these interpretations, lest we get distracted from the main focus of Mark's gospel here this morning. One interpretation is that Jesus is referring to his resurrection and ascension glory. This interpretation, it seems plausible because Jesus' disciples, all except Judas, are going to be witnesses of his glorified resurrection body, as well as his ascension and exaltation into heaven to be seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. Another interpretation is that Jesus is referring to the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit would come upon the early church in Acts 2, empowering the kingdom of God to expand throughout the world due to the effectiveness of the gospel. The church is going to spread throughout the world, in other words. Certainly, some of Jesus' disciples are going to live to see such a day where the power of the gospel is going to turn the earth upside down, so to speak. And they're going to see that through their evangelism of the word. A third interpretation is that Jesus is referring strictly to his second coming. At this time, the Son of Man is going to be seen coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Jesus teaches us in Mark 13, 26. We'll come to that in a few weeks. These interpretation, uh, these interpreters rather, uh, of this interpretation, note that in the last verse of Mark 8, verse 38, Jesus spoke of a day when he's going to come again in the glory of his Father with his holy angels to judge the living and the dead. So in light of the previous verse of the last chapter, this interpretation of verse 1 of chapter 9, it seems possible, but it makes Jesus' promise more difficult to understand since none of his disciples will remain alive to see his second coming. A fourth interpretation and one of the more popular views is that Jesus is referring to the event that we're now studying this morning, his transfiguration. While this view is not without its problems, just as many of the other interpretations are not without their problems, contextually, this interpretation that he's speaking of the transfiguration to come six days later, it makes sense. The fact that Matthew, Mark, and Luke each record this promise directly before the transfiguration seems to indicate that they interpret this experience to be a sort of fulfillment of Jesus' promise. Indeed, even the passage we just read previously in 2 Peter chapter 1 seems to suggest that even Peter took this to be a fulfillment of Jesus' promise. I'll leave it up to you to draw your own conclusions or to go into a deeper study, if you wish, on these issues and interpretations, but lest I leave some of you floundering over all the options that are presented, I want to propose to you an interpretation that accommodates some of these views that I've just listed. I would suggest that Jesus' promise in verse 1 be interpreted as fulfilled in part at his transfiguration, the event we're about to get into. It's progressively fulfilled then at his resurrection and ascension. We could even argue at Pentecost as the glory of the kingdom of God is spreading throughout the world through the uh, success of the gospel. And then it's fully fulfilled at Christ's second coming. We might call the transfiguration then a preview of coming attractions. Again, this interpretation, it's not perfect. It's got its problems as well. But it seems to answer how some who were present there listening to Jesus' teaching on discipleship would be able to see the kingdom of God after it has come with power in their own lifetime. Jesus' transfiguration, it's a preview to his resurrection glory and to the powerful coming of the kingdom of God at the consummation of all things. So on the Mount of Transfiguration, these three disciples, they're given a reassuring preview of things to come. Think of it like a movie trailer. They see the king of this kingdom in his power and glory. Let's continue reading and see exactly what they saw. 
And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. If you go over to Luke's gospel, we read that once Jesus and his inner circle have stopped climbing the mountain, the disciples, they're heavy with sleep, and Jesus goes off to pray. The implication, perhaps, is that the sun is setting, darkness is now settling in over the mountaintop. And I think that would fit well with Mark's portrayal of Jesus' prayer schedule. If you remember, there's only three times in Mark's gospel where Jesus is specifically mentioned as praying. Each of those three times, he is praying in the dark. So this darkened scenery would have only served to further intensify this unveiling of Jesus' radiant glory on top of this mountain. Luke indicates that while the disciples were off nodding their heads in sleep, Jesus is praying, and then suddenly Jesus' glory bursts forth, and the appearance of his face is significantly altered. Matthew's gospel, in Matthew 17, tells us that Jesus' face shone bright like the sun. Mark only mentions here the appearance of Jesus' clothing being transformed to become intensely white. The change in both his face as well as his clothing reveal to us something intrinsic about Jesus' nature. Firstly, the change in his facial appearance testifies that the glory that he's now displaying at that very moment is not a reflection of some outside glory that he himself did not already possess. The word transfigured in this verse here helps us to understand what really is happening in this event. The word is where we get our word metamorphosis from. The Greek word that's used here describes the process of change by which that on the inside shows forth to the outside for others to see. So we're to understand that Jesus' transfiguration is not a change in his essential nature, but rather it is the unveiling of his nature. His transfiguration was him momentarily confirming his divinity to his inner circle of disciples. Behind this curtain of Jesus' fleshly humanity is his brilliantly bright glory shining like the sun. And thankfully for these three disciples, they're not incinerated at that very moment at the sight of such glory, which indicates, I think, to us that Jesus isn't even fully revealing himself. He's restraining himself in some part so that he doesn't kill his disciples. If you go back to the Exodus account, there are many similarities that we can make between Moses' ascent and encountering of God at Mount Sinai, as well as what we are seeing here in Jesus' transfiguration. One major difference, though, between Moses' experience and Jesus' mountaintop experience is that when Moses descends from Sinai we see that his face shone as a reflection of God's glory because he had talked with God for 40 days. Here at the transfiguration, however, Jesus' face shone not as a reflection of God's glory, but it shone because he is the radiance of God's glory. The author of Hebrews wrote as much, saying he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Hebrews 1, verse 3. So this glory is intrinsic to Jesus' very nature, his very self. It's not a reflection of something on the outside. This glory is naturally radiating from within him. He is more than just fully human, we're to understand. He is also fully God. Secondly, note the change in his appearance of his clothing becoming intensely white, or as Matthew adds, his clothes became white as light. It's the only way they could describe how white and brilliant his clothes became. This testifies to Jesus' purity, his holiness, and his majesty on display for his disciples. In the Bible, we see that light and white, they're often associated with God's presence, his purity, as well as his holiness. And so the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're they're trying to emphasize Jesus' glorious divinity being unveiled for Peter, James, and and John to see. It's revealed to them that Jesus has the very same traits 
that are found in the fullness and perfection of the Godhead. Overall, Jesus gave his inner circle of disciples a vision of what is as well as what is to come. Jesus gave them a vision of the high king of the kingdom of God. It was Jesus' way of assuring his disciples that though he was going to suffer in humiliation, he would also be glorified in exaltation to reign over the kingdom of God that he had been proclaiming all throughout the region of Galilee thus far. The transfiguration, it served as a preview and guarantee for these three men that Christ's future glory and the establishment of his glorious kingdom were all going to happen, that he is going to reign as the high king over this kingdom and his people. It was a preview of things yet to come and yet an unveiling of things that already were. On top of this mountaintop experience as well, our next stop, we see two prophets. There appeared to these men, Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For Peter did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Moses and Elijah, they're significant figures in this transfiguration account. I don't want to gloss over them. I want to spend time looking at these two men. And I came up with at least five ways that their appearance in this event is significant. Number one, traditionally speaking, Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. The New Testament will occasionally refer to the compilation of the whole Old Testament as the law and the prophets. In other words, the whole of the Old Testament is represented in these two men as they're standing, conversing with Jesus. So hold on to that thought for just a minute. I'll come back to it. Number two, according to Jesus, both the law and the prophets pointed to him. After his resurrection, as he's on the road to Emmaus, talking with two disciples, Jesus taught about the necessity of his suffering as well as his glory. And we read that part of what he said to them, he said, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And then a little later on, Jesus would then address the rest of his disciples, saying to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. So the appearance of Moses and Elijah validates Jesus' messianic ministry as well as his salvific mission. And this is seen a little bit clearer from Luke's account of the transfiguration where Luke discloses to us as readers what the topic of conversation was between Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And behold, two men were talking with Jesus, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Amazing, isn't it? Here we have perhaps the greatest people in the Old Testament conversing with Jesus, the greatest figure in all of human history, over his impending death and probably even his subsequent resurrection from the dead. Everything that Jesus had just told his disciples earlier in chapter 8, here Moses and Elijah are talking with Jesus about in chapter 9. Number three, another significant reason why I think Moses and Elijah's appearance here is um, because it further solidifies and it showcases Jesus' superiority over them. Jesus is superior to Moses and to Elijah. The Father is going to say in verse 7, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. And after the Father declares this, both Moses and Elijah vanish from the scene. Only Jesus remains. Surely this would have been a powerful illustration to his watching disciples that Jesus is one who is greater than Moses and Elijah. And that leads to number four. If Moses and Elijah represent the summation of the whole Old Testament, the law and the prophets, and if they point to Jesus and Jesus is greater than they are, then their appearance on this mountain seems to suggest what Jesus had taught earlier in Matthew chapter 5. 
He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. In other words, the appearance of Moses and Elijah should have confirmed to these disciples that the law and the prophets, the whole Old Testament, culminates in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, the Old Covenant is rendered obsolete, not because it's useless, but because it's served its purpose and it's fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, in Jesus, a new and better covenant, a new and living covenant, has come. And that brings me to the fifth reason Moses and Elijah's appearance is significant. Their appearance, as well as their disappearance from this mountain, symbolizes that they're giving way to Jesus as the authoritative and final revelatory word of God. The author of Hebrews confirms this in the opening of his epistle. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, people like Moses or Elijah. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, Jesus, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. All this to say, Moses and Elijah, they're giving way to Jesus as the superior, all-surpassing, and final revelation of God and his word to mankind. In Jesus Christ, we're given the keys to understanding our Old Testament. By Christ's light, do we see the shadows of the old system pointing us to the new realities in the new. Through the Son of God, the Word made flesh, we're given a perfect revelation of God. His nature, God's ways, God's will to man is revealed in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we would do well to listen to Jesus as we're going to see the Father command these three disciples. And so we come to the final stop on this mountaintop experience. Peter is shut up from talking out of fear when the Father makes a proclamation. A cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved Son, listen to Him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. I want to point out three experiences that the disciples had at this point on the mountain. The first pertains to what they saw. The second pertains to what they heard. And then the third to what they are given. Firstly, what they saw. There was a cloud that these disciples saw. First, we might wonder about the relevancy of such a cloud in our modern day. We, we think of a cloud just as something in the sky, nothing significant about that. But if we go back to the Old Testament, there is really something significant about this cloud. Throughout the Old Testament, the appearance of a cloud such as this would symbolize God's presence and glory among his people. For example, we see such a cloud enveloping Sinai. Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. On Sinai, God manifested his presence and his glory to Moses for 40 straight days through this cloud. And then later in Exodus, once the tabernacle is constructed... We read that God's glory filled the entire tabernacle in the form of a cloud. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. After Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem, 480 years after the Exodus, we see something similar take place. The priests, they came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. I show you these Old Testament passages to emphasize that this cloud on the Mount of Transfiguration was not any old, ordinary cloud that we see in the sky today. This cloud represents that the presence and the very glory of God the Father has now descended upon the mountain and is enveloping Jesus' disciples as well as Moses and Elijah temporarily. And that brings us to the second thing that these disciples experienced. 
There was a confirmation from God the Father relating to Jesus Christ and his identity that these disciples heard. The very beginning of verse 7. This is my beloved Son. This brings us back to Jesus' baptism. Back in Mark chapter 1, verse 11. It has echoes of God's declaration there to his own Son. The difference, though, between the declaration at Jesus' baptism and then this one here at his transfiguration is who God the Father is addressing. At Jesus' baptism, God the Father spoke personally to his own Son. He's confirming Jesus' mission, and he's commencing his public ministry. But now at his transfiguration... Jesus was not the one being personally addressed. This time, the Father is addressing Jesus' disciples. We might say that God the Father now adds his own testimony concerning Jesus in Mark's gospel. We've heard from Mark in verse 1 of chapter 1. We've recently heard from Peter back in chapter 8. We'll soon hear from Jesus in chapter 10. And then a little bit later on towards the end in Mark 15, we'll hear from the Roman centurion. But right here on top of this mountain, in chapter 9, we have the Father's confession concerning Jesus' identity. He is my beloved Son. This word beloved, it's crucial to understanding what the Father is telling his disciples about Jesus. Beloved, it conveys that Jesus is dearly loved in a very special way, and that Jesus is unique and supremely prized by the Father. That Jesus is the Father's beloved Son. It sets him apart from Moses and Elijah, who are there on top of the mountain, and it designates Jesus as an unrivaled person of authority. This validates Jesus' divine identity and authenticity to Peter, James, and John. It lays the foundation for the very next part of the Father's proclamation that they hear. So thirdly, what they experience, there's a command that they're given to obey. They've seen the cloud of God's presence and glory. They've heard his voice confirming Jesus' identity. Now they're given a direct command from the Father concerning his beloved Son. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. That semicolon could really be a therefore. This is my beloved Son. Therefore, listen to him. That is, pay attention to him. Heed him. Respond to his words and his teaching with faith and obedience. This is one of Jesus' favorite words to use in his own teaching and preaching. One of his most used phrases in all the Gospels, as well as in the book of Revelation, is the phrase, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Literally, he who has ears to hear, listen. It's the same word that the Father uses here in this command to the disciples. So this command from the Father, it's only further accentuating to the disciples That when Moses and Elijah vanish from sight, they now have this audible, visible confirmation of Jesus' unique and ultimate authority over them. Moses and Elijah, they exit, seen left. Jesus is remaining. Truly, in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. The implication for those who are his disciples from God's command here is that they believe and do what Jesus says. What the Father relates here to his disciples is that he has given his beloved Son all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, we must listen to him. Overall, we've just seen really an explanation of what's been going on on top of this mountain. Jesus is now unveiled as God's beloved and radiant son to his inner circle of disciples, but there's really still some application for us today to walk away with and to take from this event. How are we to respond to this glorious event of his transfiguration so many years ago? What are we to take from God's word today? That's where the second half of our theme comes in. The transfiguration of Jesus is a call for us to do primarily two things. First, look to Jesus and behold his glory. Beholding Christ and his glory is the A to Z of Christianity. Looking to Jesus by faith, that's how we become justified, that is positionally declared righteous before a holy God, saved by his grace 
and receive eternal life. The rest of the Christian experience and life is spent with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, so that we can become more like him. It's been said that we become what we behold. That's especially true for the Christian. Paul put it this way to the Corinthian church, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. This speaks of our progressive sanctification. As we daily gaze upon the glory of our Lord and Savior in His Word, through our communion with Him in prayer as well, the Holy Spirit changes us to conform us more and more into the image of Christ. And the good news is that one day we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. Commenting on these two passages from these two apostles, Paul and John, John Owen once wrote, Indeed, it is by beholding the glory of Christ that believers are first gradually transformed into His image and then brought into the eternal enjoyment of it, because they shall forever be like Him, for they shall see Him as He is. On this depend our present comforts and future blessedness. This is the life and reward of our souls. Owen would then go on to write that no one shall ever behold the glory of Christ by sight in heaven who does not behold Christ's glory in some measure by faith in this world. And so I would challenge you today that if you would ever hope to see the glory of Jesus Christ by sight, not for a moment as these disciples do on the Mount of Transfiguration, but for an eternity on Mount Zion, look to Christ today by faith and live. Look and live. Trust Him for salvation. Turn to Him for grace. Then you can be sure that you'll enjoy such visions of glory yet to come when the King returns to finally and forever establish the kingdom of God with power. So first, look to Jesus. Behold His glory. Second, listen to Jesus and believe Him and obey Him. Listen to Jesus. This is God the Father's direct command to all of Christ's disciples, not just the inner circle on that mountain, but to every single disciple since then. We need to respond to all of Jesus' words as His disciples do in John chapter 6. There, Jesus has just said some very hard words to the crowd that they can't really stomach about faith and eternal life. Many who had claimed to be His disciples would then depart from Jesus at this point. And so Jesus would then turn to the twelve and He would ask them, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we've believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Where, can, where else can we go but Jesus? Only He has the words of eternal life. Therefore, we love Him, and if we love Him, we will do what He says. We will believe Him at His Word. Because of Jesus, we have the prophetic Word of God more fully confirmed, to which we would do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in the darkness of this world until He returns or until we're received by Him in glory. So here's the bottom line for us today. Look and listen to Jesus with eyes and ears of faith. Look to Him and believe He is God's beloved and radiant Son. Behold His glory. And listen to Him and obey His Word. In this way, we're promised to be transformed by the Holy Spirit, to become more like Jesus as we behold Him and as we believe Him. Look to Jesus unveiled in this passage as we look forward to a day when He's going to be fully and forever unveiled in our presence. So may we grow deeper in the grace and the knowledge of our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that we may see Him as He truly is, and so that we may be found to be like Him in every way when He returns. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, you are glorious, radiantly glorious, more so than we can comprehend. Lord, you've given us a sliver of revelation this morning to catch a glimpse of glory, of things that are and things that are yet to be. Lord, until that day when everything is fully unveiled for us, we ask that you would slowly pull the veil away from our faces, that as we gaze at your word, we would see Jesus clearer and clearer every day, and that by seeing him as he is, we would one day be like him. Lord, that is the desire of our hearts. Transform us and conform us into Christ, I pray. Amen.